Today on the Banjo Says Podcast, we'll talk about Behringer acquiring Aston Microphones, Dr. Seuss being canceled, and a couple of other things, so go ahead and stick around. Let's start with a little bit of sad news, and it's not going to be sad for most people, but if you are in the audio industry, if you pay attention to this stuff, you may find yourself being a little bit sad. And that is that Behringer has acquired Aston Microphones. And when I say Behringer, I don't necessarily mean Behringer the company, I mean Uli Behringer, the person who owns Music Tribe, which is the parent company of the audio company Behringer, but Music Tribe being the parent company that's owned by Behringer, has acquired Aston Microphones. Are you confused yet? Me neither. But what does this mean for Aston Microphones? Are we going to see any massive changes? Are we going to see crazy products? We don't know. I will link the press release on Aston Mike's website down below, but I do want to read one line from that for you because I think this indicates at least one thing that will be happening following this acquisition. And it says the Aston team will now equally have full access to Music Tribe's extensive resources and advanced automated system platforms in such areas as product engineering, manufacturing, supply chain, and finance. And this leads me to one conclusion that Aston Microphones is going to move manufacturing of their products from the UK, which is where they currently manufacture them, and that manufacturing will move to Behringer's factories in China. Or I shouldn't say Behringer, I should say Music Tribe's factories in China. Now, for many folks, this won't cause any kind of problem. They won't see any change But for me, I have actively been trying to purchase fewer items that are manufactured in China because I know that money that goes to the Chinese economy ultimately goes and helps fund the CCP. And I don't want to contribute to the CCP. For me, it's going to be a sad day if we do see Aston Mike's shift manufacturing from the UK to China. But that's just based on my personal morals. I'm sure other people don't really give a damn what's going on in China or what the CCP is doing. But for me, I actively try to avoid that. Then as far as the products, I don't know what this will mean for it. I don't know if we will see Music Tribe try to go up market, if they'll try to continue to develop $300, $400, $500 microphones, or if we'll start to see Music Tribe push Aston to develop more entry-level items around $100, maybe $150, like the new Behringer, Ele- not Behringer, the Aston Element, which was about $160, if I'm not mistaken. I'm guessing we'll see more of a focus on the entry-level price point because that seems to be where Music Tribe's subsidiaries really focus because I think that's the largest market, honestly. And it makes perfect sense. More people have $100 to spend on a microphone than $1,000. Not many people have the disposable income or earn money from using that microphone to justify the expenditure of spending $1,000 on a mic. So there's going to be more people who are going to spend $100 on a microphone. Makes perfect sense why they would focus on that. It will just be a very sad day for me if they go that route. And that's pretty much it. I would love to hear from you in the comments on YouTube. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think this is going to ultimately be a good thing for Aston Mikes, or do you think it's going to be bad? Do you think they're going to position themselves as a more budget entry-level option, or will they go up market? And next up in the news, we have Dr. Seuss being canceled slash banned? Question mark? No, not really. He was not canceled. He was not banned. His books were not canceled. His books were not banned. What happened is Dr. Seuss Enterprises, the owner of all of the IP of the copyrights, I believe, made a decision that they would no longer publish six of Dr. Seuss's books. And here is the entirety of the statement that they put out. I will read it for you, and I will also link it in the episode notes. Today, on Dr. Seuss's birthday, Dr. Seuss Enterprises celebrates reading and also our mission of supporting all children and families with messages of hope, inspiration, inclusion, and friendship. We are committed to action, 
To that end, Dr. Seuss Enterprises, working with a panel of experts, including educators, reviewed our catalog of titles and made the decision last year to cease publication and licensing of the following titles. And to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street, If I Ran the Zoo, McElligot's Pool, On Beyond Zebra, Scrambled Eggs Super, and The Cat's Quizzer. These books portray people in ways that are hurtful and wrong. Ceasing sales of these books is only part of our commitment and our broader plan to ensure Dr. Seuss Enterprises' catalog represents and supports all communities and families. I don't know about you, but based on that statement, I don't view this as Dr. Seuss being canceled or banned. To me, it just sounds like a company or small group of people deciding that they would no longer publish a specific set of books. There are plenty of out-of-print books, and that makes them very collectible. There's nothing surprising there. I don't look at the 1978 version of Dawn of the Dead and say, oh my gosh, can you believe that this movie was canceled and banned? Because it wasn't. I just look at the 1978 Dawn of the Dead and say, wow, this Richard Rubenstein guy is a real piece of work and I think he's a big butt wipe. For a little bit of context there, if you're not familiar with Dawn of the Dead, the 1978 version, it is out of print because Richard Rubenstein made some bad investments in making a 3D version of that movie, I believe, and it didn't pay off. So he has slowly increased the licensing fee for the 1978 Dawn of the Dead, and nobody wants to pay it meaning that movie is out of print, you can't get it streaming anywhere, you can't buy any physical copies. There have been some UK releases of it. Unfortunately, if you try to order it, I think it's second print film, something like that. I tried to pre-order it, they wouldn't ship to the US, it's exclusive to the UK, and I really dislike Richard Rubenstein because I want that movie on Blu-ray. You jerk. Just suck it up. You made a bad investment. Deal with it. But back on topic... As I said, I don't think that Dr. Seuss Industries, Enterprises, whatever it is, canceled or banned Dr. Seuss. But then we get to a problem. We have eBay. eBay made the decision to delist these listings, delist the sale of these six books, and they have claimed that this falls under their offensive content policy. It violates their offensive content policy. And there was a quote directly from somebody at eBay who said, eBay is currently sweeping our marketplace to remove these items. And many of these books were taken down, it seems. But there are still some up to be completely fair. And to be even more fair, do you know what else is up? There are still listings for Mein Kampf. You know, the book written by the World War II bad guy named Adolf Hitler, that piece of crap, that scumbag, his books are still up. <laughs> There was also a book called The Turner Diaries. I had never heard of this before, but apparently this is some white supremacist book and that was still up, but it doesn't look like that is up anymore. And eBay said that both of those books, The Turner Diaries and Mein Kampf, should violate their offensive content policy and should be delisted. I am just so thrilled that eBay has taken a stance against this offensive content and they have banned the books written by Adolf Hitler, the man who was responsible for the genocide of millions of people, banning the Turner Diaries, a white supremacist book, and then also banning the, the scumbag, the hateful offensive author who taught us to hop on pop. I am so glad that they... <laughs> it, it sounds insane when you put it that way, doesn't it? A Nazi, a white supremacist, and the guy who who wrote Green Eggs and Ham. <laughs> it's insanity. It's absolute insanity that eBay is doing this. But eBay seems to be the only company doing this at this point. Now, I also want to point out something that I find hilarious because it illustrates how little people think before taking action. And a lot of folks online were screaming, oh my God, they're banning Dr. Seuss. They're burning his books. We need to do something. Rah! And freaking out. And what did that lead to? All of Dr. Seuss's books that were still available for sale shot to the top of the list on Amazon. The top 10 selling books, I think, were all Dr. Seuss. 
And it seems that this was done under the guise of, I can't believe that these corporations are banning these books. We're going to stick it to them. We're going to show the man by buying these books and holding up green eggs and ham. Once you start to look into this and you realize that Dr. Seuss Industries or Enterprises, whatever it is, are the ones who decided to no longer print these books. And then when you think, if I buy a new version of Green Eggs and Ham, who gets that money? Dr. Seuss Enterprises, what are you doing? You are not telling this company, I disavow the behavior that you're taking. I think it's ridiculous that you were doing that. You are proving to them that there is a huge monetary benefit to banning these books, to no longer printing these books, rather. By no longer printing these books, Dr. Seuss Enterprises probably earned a crap load of money. I can't think of the last time that Dr. Seuss was the top 10 list of Amazon's book sales. Probably never in my lifetime, in the existence of Amazon that hasn't been a thing, but now it has. And you have proven all of these people who went out and bought these books to stick it to the man and say, look, you can't censor this. This is our content now. We own the physical copy. Well, now Dr. Seuss Enterprises learned just put a book out of print and then say it's because it's racist and people will buy all of your books. Therefore, I have a proposition. I have a business idea for any authors out there who are struggling to make sales. Come out and say, I disavow this content that was written six decades ago. I am no longer going to to allow this to be printed. And then all of your other books will sky. I think that, okay, okay, here's a, everybody hates J.K. Rowling now because she's a, a trans exclusionary radical feminist. I think that's a turf. I think that's what it means. Everybody hates her because of that, because she's labeled that. Now, what if... Her publisher for the Harry Potter books said they were going to take one of the books out of print. (laughs) Those books would shoot to the top of Amazon's bestseller list. I I'll give that idea out there for free. They should do that. Ban one of the Harry Potter books. Those sales will skyrocket. Absolutely ridiculous what people did in response to this. Oh, we hate what you did. So what are we going to do? We're going to give you a bunch of money. Really sticking it to the man there, you dummies. Dummies, think through what you're doing before you do it. I will link Dr. Seuss Enterprise's statement below and eBay's article on the Wall Street Journal about delisting in case you want to read a little bit more about them. And the last piece of news that we have is from Twitter, and it's that Twitter is rolled out a clubhouse competitor. This is called Spaces, and apparently it's the exact same thing as Clubhouse, but... Twitter beat Clubhouse to releasing this to Android because Clubhouse was exclusive to iOS. Now, Twitter rolled out Spaces, and that is available on iOS and Android, but not to everybody. Not everybody can create a space. It is exclusive to a select number of elite people on Twitter who can create spaces. And then I think everybody can join, but only the special people can create their own spaces. In order to learn about this, I was reading up on Twitter's help page, and I have to say, while I was reading this, I felt tremendously left out. I felt left behind. Whatever happened to no child left behind? What happened to no nerd left behind? Twitter, help me out here. The reason I felt left out is because while I was reading this, they were saying, in order to create a space, you need to open up your fleets panel and then swipe to the far left and then click spaces. And I started thinking, what the hell is a fleet? I don't have a fleet. What's a fleet? I don't know what that is. I have never heard of, I have never seen fleets because I don't have Twitter on my phone. I don't have access to spaces. I don't have access to Clubhouse because I don't have these apps on my phone. Maybe I'm the crazy one for not wanting these apps on my phone and giving them access to my photos, giving them access to my camera, giving them access to my microphone, giving them access to my location data. That seems like a terrible idea and a terrible invasion of privacy. Yet everybody does this. Everybody seems to be perfectly okay with this. And because of that, these applications, these social media sites develop exclusively for those apps. But for the tinfoil hat wearing lunatics like me who don't want to be spied on, I guess we don't get access to these features because we don't want to give up everything about us. 
But as far as this feature, I do not understand the appeal of Spaces or Clubhouse for that matter. Because to my understanding, it seems as though these are going to be nothing more than a crappier version and a, or a crappier sounding and a less well-organized version of a Discord voice call. Discord voice calls, you can get up to 320 kilobits per second, and you can use it on your computer, meaning people can connect proper microphones and audio interfaces and have all sorts of processing leading into it so it's going to sound nice and crisp and easy to understand. With all of these apps being exclusive or all of these features being exclusive to the phone, it's going to sound like crap. What's the appeal of it? Let me know in the comments down below. Maybe I am missing the point. Maybe I'm just an idiot. There's no denying I'm an idiot, but I don't know if this is why I'm an idiot or not. And that is it for the news this week. Let's jump to what I've been testing and you have been listening to it. This is another podcast episode, which is a one-off. Even though I used this over a year ago for a month, I wanted to throw this on the microphone stand again before I do a full review just to remind myself of my thoughts of it. I have been using it to record some acoustic guitar. I think it sounds outstanding on the acoustic guitar. A really fun sound on that. I recorded a cover of Dump Weed by Blink-182 <laughs> because I am still stuck in 2001. Whatever it is what it is. And I am using this on the mode in between cardioid and hypercardioid. Somewhere in between, I just have a 40 hertz high pass filter, no pad, no nothing else. And there you go. That's what I've been using. I really enjoy how it sounds. A fairly neutral sound, especially compared to the AKG C414 XL2, which has a much broader presence and treble boost, if I'm remembering correctly. Quite a different sound, but pretty nice sounding to my ears. Let me know what you think of it. Let's jump to what you had to say. And the first comment comes from Dick. He says, I saw the Zoom P4 on the desk, just got one. And well, it's like 85% of my Rodecaster Pro for the size and price. Wow. And it drives my RE20 and SM58 without the need for a FET head. Dial setting before six and seven. Is it quite the same as the Rodecaster? No, but it's one third of the price of the Rodecaster and a small fraction of the size and weight. And you can active mix minus on the USB in one of the menus. Dick, thank you very much for the comment. The reason I wanted to include this is the last episode. I wasn't certain if you were able to do a USB mix minus on this little device. Turns out you can because Dick has had this device for a little bit and played around with it. And that is a great feature to have, something that was really exciting about the Rodecaster Pro, having that USB mix minus, the automatic mix minus out of the, the cell phone out, which also is available on the Zoom Pod Track P4 as well. Pretty cool device. I don't 100% know if that's correct about driving the RE20 and SM58. Because if I'm not mistaken, the preamps are the same as the Zoom H4 and H6. And those preamps were pretty noisy. A pretty noisy set of pre's. I think an EIN of around negative 124, which is quite loud considering negative 128 is a, a good starting point. It may even be higher than that. Was it negative 123? Those are pretty noisy preamps. But... There may be at least plenty of gain to drive your dynamics. Happy to hear it. I would probably throw a FET head or a cloud lifter in there as well, just because that will improve the noise floor quite drastically. Next comment comes from Guy, and he says, For Australia to demand that Facebook pay news orgs for links to their content? What a bunch of BS. Damn it, you're making me defend effing Facebook. And K Walk This Way says, I don't like Facebook. However, this is an example of Australia's government trying to play favoritism, a clear example of overregulation that will lead to hurting people they didn't intend. And the reason that I wanted to include these two comments is because I think it's interesting to see the turning of the tables where people will crap all over Facebook. I am one of them as well, but then seeing a government overstep their bounds and try to overregulate an industry, and then we all turn our heads and say, stop it. 
Facebook, you're doing something okay here by banning that. It sucks that you're doing it. It's going to hurt people, but we at least understand why you're doing it because the government should not be, they should not have the authority to demand that you pay news companies for including links to their website. You're giving them marketing, so we're going to make you pay them for marketing for them. That's so stupid. It's a very weird turn of events where we are now defending Facebook's actions. What has happened? 2021 is not off to a good start, is it? Next comment comes from Penty, and they say, With Google being what it is, showing only search results it likes, we're soon back to the 90s with web pages that gather links to sites. Penty, thank you very much for the comment. I think you are onto something here. I do something kind of like this. I don't have a page on my website with links to a bunch of sources, although maybe I should do that. On my YouTube page, I have other channels and I title that Get a Second Opinion because I am a very big advocate of nobody looking at one source and saying, that's it. I understand everything. I'm going to make some purchases now or I'm going to go out and say this is the truth. I don't believe in that. So instead of doing that, instead of putting myself out there as the final authority on everything, on everything related to microphones, I say, listen to me, but then go listen to Booth Junkie, go listen to Sound Speeds, go listen to Obscure Mics, go listen to Audio Hotline, go listen to Produce Like a Pro, go listen to any number of people. I have, I think, 30 channels in there who are audio-focused YouTubers. Some have only 200 subs, but I think it's good to have as many different opinions on these, these microphones, on these audio interfaces as you possibly can get. Because by getting a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth opinion, what's the worst that can happen? You're, you're better informed? Oh no! Oh no! And also, why would anybody think that linking to other channels that are quote-unquote competitors would be a bad thing? It's not as though people look at one video and say, I have all the information that I need. I'm moving on with my life. People don't have the option or people don't make a decision to watch just one channel. People have plenty of time out of their day. Some folks may like me better. Some folks may like Alan from Sound Speeds better. Some folks may like Bark from, from Obscure Mics better. That's perfectly fine. The entire point of what I'm saying is I already do something like this and I think that we will start to see more community-based promotion where we don't rely solely on algorithms to discover new content, where we don't rely solely on algorithms for our own content to be discovered, and we rely more on word of mouth and through networking, which is, I, which, which is what I try to do with my YouTube channel because I want to see these other channels improve, continue to create content because as they grow, as they improve, that's another person that is offering up opinions and that's better for the people who are looking on YouTube. That's my take on it and thank you very much for that. Maybe I should start a page on podcastage.com to discuss or list a bunch of different audio sources that I think are cool. And the last comment comes from Travis and he says, I feel like a lot of us have given up more than we will ever know by moving things into the large social media platforms such as Facebook and even YouTube. Before, I am sure a lot of us used to have our own websites. I hosted it on my own web server on my own domain name. It was in my basement because I had no traffic or any need for more performance. But now that I am trying to become a content creator, it is perhaps time to bring those back. Travis, thank you very much for the comment, and I think you are exactly right. A lot of us viewed social media as this new free way to host content, a free way to post content, and a free way to get promotion, assuming you're not using or talking about Facebook, because if you have followers on Facebook and you want to reach them, you have to pay for it. Facebook is the worst website ever. I absolutely hate Facebook. I stopped using Facebook years ago as far as uh, pages promoting my YouTube channel or podcast. I don't use Facebook. It's a piece of crap. But I do think that every single content creator who wants to make it more of a business, make it more of a living, or develop a community ought to have their own website. And it's, and it's something that I've screamed about for years, 
I know the people who listen to this show regularly are sick and tired of me screaming about it, but I will provide a condensed version of my spiel right now. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever social media platform it is, they do not need your promotion. They do not need you to provide them any more exposure. Instead of saying, hey, go check out my Twitter page, go check out my YouTube page, say, hey, go to my website, Travis.com, and there are links to all of my social media accounts there. That way, people know that if you ever get banned, they can still go to Travis.com and find links to everything that you do. That's what I do. Instead of saying, go check out YouTube.com slash podcastage, I typically say, go check out podcastage.com. You want to see what I'm working on? Go check out bandrewscott.com. I have links to everything that I work on. I have a blog on all of these sites. It's a lot easier and a lot better for you to promote those websites as opposed to Twitter and YouTube and Facebook because why the hell are you going to give Facebook and Twitter and YouTube this free promotion of saying Twitter.com, Twitter.com, Facebook.com, Facebook.com? They don't need that exposure. So promote your own domain. You don't even need to post anything at the time. Create a splash page, say Travis.com, and then there you have links to all of your social media pages. That way, people know the domain. You are promoting your own domain as opposed to some massive corporation. Do yourself the favor and promote yourself as opposed to a company. There you go. That's my take on it. I hope that was a coherent rant or condensed version of my spiel. (laughs) I don't know if it was. And the last thing that I want to address in the What You Had to Say segment is not based on a question per se. It's a theory, an idea that I kind of wanted to explore. It is that, can you use Neumanns or condenser microphones for podcasting? Now, I have been quite a firm advocate to recommend dynamic microphones for podcasting, and I still do. I still think that a standard broadcast dynamic or even a handheld dynamic is going to suit the majority of entry-level podcasters better. But I do not think that this means that condensers or Neumann microphones cannot be used for podcasting. Because if you are getting to the point where you're spending $1,000 on a microphone or $3,600 or $7,000 for a microphone, chances are you are pretty deep into the audio file side of things and you are going to have some sound treatment in your room So you have to worry about reflections in your room a bit less. You have to worry about the off-axis coloration a little bit less, even though if you're spending $3,600, you're going to have pretty nice off-axis coloration. So the entire point is, I do think you can use condensers and Neumann microphones for podcasts. You do just need to ensure that you have sound treatment. And the idea that the majority of podcasters do not have sound treatment may be true, But also, the majority of podcasters are not spending $3,000 on a microphone. The people who are spending $3,000 on a microphone, chances are, are deep in it and will have audio treatment, meaning they will be able to use condenser microphones and Neumann microphones and get a pretty nice sound out of it. That's my take on it. I wanted to share my thoughts there because I wanted to make sure that my ideas and my stance was clear. Because it's difficult to explain ourselves via 200 characters on these social media sites. And it's also a very fun topic. Because I have been very vocal, a very vocal advocate for dynamics for podcasts. And that's a generality. A generality? A generalization that I say. Because I think the majority of people do not have sound treatment. But once you have sound treatment, your options open up and it becomes a very exciting world. Because you can use Neumanns. And it's so much fun. And by the way, NPR, they use Neumanns. I believe they use the U87s. Just a little tidbit there. Now now let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. All right, welcome back to the Ask Bandrew segment. If you have any questions, why are they so loud outside? 
If you have any questions, you can head over to askbandrew.com. There are instructions on how to send in audio, video, and text-based questions. I do prefer audio and video because I am a stupid idiot who does not does not know how to read or apparently speak. <laughs> Words are very hard today. And we get to hear how you sound on your microphone. Head over to askbandrew.com and send those in if you have any questions. Let's jump to the very first question, and it is a voice submission from Scott. Take it away, Scott. Hey, Bandrew. I had a couple questions for you. I'm an e-learning content designer, um, and so I have to do a bunch of audio voiceovers for all the videos that I make for online learning. And before watching your videos, I was using a blue snowball, and I had a couple comments about my audio quality. And in the past, it didn't really matter because I was doing it for people in the company, whereas now I'm making stuff for the end user. So quality is really important. Uh, So I went out and got a RE320. And I have some pretty bad, I don't know if you can hear it in this or not, but I have some pretty bad background noise. I live in a, a pretty busy city and I have three exterior walls in this room. So I get a lot of background noise. But I was wondering if this microphone really helped cut that out. I also have a foam box that I put around the microphone, and I think that really helps, but maybe you can hear the background noise or maybe not. I'll pause for a second. So the other question that I had was about my processing. I use Adobe Audition, and my process is usually just to record then I cut out things like the mouse clicking and mouth smacks, you know, like when you're talking, and (laughs) that was probably weird. Then I bring the peaks up to about negative 6 dB and use a single band compressor to bring those peaks down a little bit, and then maybe bring the audio up a little bit more just because I have background music in my videos, so the audio has to be pretty loud. Then I run a noise reduction process, so usually I keep that around the middle. I found if I do noise reduction all the way, it makes my voice sound really hollow, and I don't want that. Uh, So usually I keep that just enough so that you can't really hear any background noise. And other than that, I just run a de-esser, and that's pretty much it. People say my S's are super strong, uh, so you can probably tell with that sentence, but uh, that's pretty much all I do. So I just wanted to see if you had any input on any equipment uh, or any further editing that I can do to my audio, that would be super helpful. Uh, So thank you so much for all the work you do and give me some great advice. All righty. Thank you very much for the voice submission. And to answer the questions, do I hear the background noise? No, it was not apparent there. It seems as though the RE320 is doing a very good job at rejecting the noise from the three walls that are facing the street. As far as any input to further processing and editing your audio, I think that everything you're doing is correct. It's just about fine tuning your settings and playing around with the order of operations here. I know that the signal flow path is a controversial topic. Some folks will say compress and then noise remove. I tend to do noise removal early on because I want to, I will do a spectral denoise if anything, and I want to remove any kind of line noise and hiss before I compress and boost that up because I don't want that to get baked into my audio any more than it already is. If I do any noise removal at all, I typically don't anymore. I used to a little bit more. I'm fairly lenient with that kind of stuff now. So as far as the actual procedures that you're doing, it sounds as though everything that you're doing is correct. I can't tell you exactly what knob to turn and what what plugin because I don't have your raw audio. I don't have your plugins. It's all about playing around and finding what you think sounds best, but also play around with the order of operations. Put the noise gate first, put it last, see which one sounds best to you because that is the ultimate test. Which one sounds the best? There's no, there's no correct answers here. It is just what sounds best to our ears, and that is the proper solution. And it's not going to be the same answer for everybody, I don't think. <laughs> I know it's not going to be the same answer for everybody. 
Also, there is a little bit of a trick that you could try with an EQ, and you're not going to be doing any kind of EQ to your voice. This is an EQ for the bed of music that you have. I don't know the precise frequencies that you should be doing this on. You're going to have to play around with it. But do a dB or two cut for the mids to make a little bit of room for your voice, and that will make it so you don't have to boost your vocals as much to sit on top of the track, it will actually make a little bit of space for your vocals to sit in because the voice is more of a mid-focused instrument, for lack of a better word. So do a little bit of an EQ and make some room in the mids for your voice. And that EQ dip will be specific to your voice because your voice is going to be at a different frequency than mine and so on and so forth. So play around with that and you could get some good results and make your voice sit a little bit better with the music. Next, we have an email from Matthew and he says, thanks for the great reviews on mics. Yeti X review convinced me I'm better off with a cardioid pattern USB dynamic mic. Don't have a quiet studio setup, more home office with background noise. Basically, I want the best 200 plus or minus USB dynamic cardioid mic. What's the best work from home, school from home, mostly web conferences like Zoom, mic in an area that isn't treated like your studio? Looking at the Rode Podcaster, new version of the Razer Siren Elite, ATR2100 USB, sure Beta 58 or similar, plus a mic boom arm and a shock mount. For under $300, how would you set up video conferencing? I'm open to XLR options, but with a mic, Mixer, boom arm, shock mount, and possibly a cloud lifter. I'm over 500. Thanks, Matthew. Matthew, thank you very much for the email. Make sure to stick around to the last email because I do a lot of examples there with different microphones. Quick answer, best audio setup for video conferencing at $200. Microphone, boom arm, a shock mount, and the Samson Q2U or the Audio-Technica ATR2100 USB, that should put you under 200 bucks, and you will sound golden for the majority of use cases. Nobody is going to complain about that. You just have to be the one to, to decide which of those microphones you like the sound of better. Do you like the Q2U or the ATR2100? There you go. Hopefully that helps you make your decision, but also, again, make sure to stick around to the last question here because I do a lot of examples mainly for XLR dynamics but that will give you some ideas if you do want to go the XLR route. Next let's jump to a video submission and if you want to learn from this I would suggest checking out the video version of this podcast bandrewsays.com because this gentleman refers to plugins and he just shows the plugins on screen but does not describe exactly what he is looking at but let's jump to that video submission right now. Why am I struggling to speak so much today? Good golly. Hey, Andrew, I got a couple of questions for you about my microphone setup. Um, I want to start a YouTube channel. It's going to be an educational IT channel to help people learn about IT related things. The other aspect of it is I want to put it on my resume so that way potential employers can kind of look at my YouTube videos and see that I have skills that they might be looking for and hopefully help me get a higher paying IT job. I don't have a lot of experience in audio setup, so I'm gonna kinda go through this with the best of my knowledge for you. Um, I'm using the Rode Pod mic, and then I picked up a USB audio interface. It's the Scarlett Solo, it's the third generation. It's just got the single mic input, and I'll be recording using OBS. I have everything recording at 320 uh, audio, the audio bit rates 320. So on the slick EQ, I kind of understand this a little bit. Um, this is, this is kind of set up how I like, um, this is kind of giving me that boomier, uh, broadcast voice that I want. I think this is possibly good. I'm hoping you can kind of look at this and see if there's anything in here based on what you're hearing that I should change. Um, but I kind of like these settings, I think. Um, again, I don't really know much about this. This is Nova. This is my uh, one of my other equalizers. Um, I do know that I used this lower setting here for my assets. My s I know we wanted to make it so it didn't like puncture people's ears when I was saying like saying S's. Um, yep. 
<laughs> and then to Coleman off, these are the settings that I have for this. Uh, I don't really understand exactly what this does. I had my headset on and I was kind of adjusting things based on what I thought was good. Uh, wider. Wider was kind of a cool plugin. I probably don't need this, but I do like the way that it sounds. If you're wearing headphones and listening to this, and then we drop this up to 100%, uh, it sounds really cool. It kind of like expands um, my voice, I guess, makes it wider. Uh, like 200% is really crazy sounding. So I've been keeping this at, uh, oh crap, oh, I've been keeping this at 25%. I think that sounds pretty good. And then the expander, it's just the OBS expander. This is what I've got it set at based at what I saw somebody else had their set at. So I left it at that. It, I think that's basically all the settings. If this seems like audio that you could listen to without like clicking off the video because the audio sucks, you know, give me a thumbs up. Let me know um, if there's any tweaks you think I can make. That would be awesome too. Oh, and then, so this is basically how I have that set up. The gain is just, it's maxed on the microphone input. I don't have the 48 volt thing on. I don't really understand what that does. I was playing with it. It doesn't sound like it does anything. So I, it might not be for this mic. I don't know. I don't really know. It's basically set up the best that I could set it up on my own. If you have any suggestions, let me know. If you don't, that's cool. Talk to you later. Thanks for all the help. All righty. Thank you very much for the video submission. And I will not go too crazy in depth in terms of processing. We'll walk through general ideas. As far as the EQ plugin, I would take off the 12 decibel boost at 85 hertz. I think that is far too excessive. It is a little bit nuts. I would move that boost up to maybe somewhere between 100 and 200 hertz and decrease it from plus 12 to maybe plus two, and then also add a high pass filter around 50 to 60 hertz, depending on where your voice sits, to remove any kind of low end rumble that is not necessary or needed in the recording. Also on the EQ, I think you should roll back the five kilohertz high shelf from plus 10 dB to maybe plus two dB. A 10 dB boost is quite excessive, and I don't think that kind of boost is really necessary, especially on the pod mic. Then your de I think that's fine. The compressor, you're getting 2 to 3 dB of gain reduction. Perfectly fine there. Then we get to the wider plugin. I am going to put this in the kindest way that I can. I absolutely hate this plugin with every fiber of my being. This is, I hate this. I loathe this plugin so damn much. There is no reason for your voice to... <laughs> I'm sorry if that came across as mean. I just hated how this sounded. You are not doing ASMR. You have a mono microphone. Leave it as a mono microphone. <laughs> it sounds weird. It sounds unnatural. I absolutely despised how this sounded on your audio. Please get rid of it. Or if you love it, keep it on. I don't care. It's not my audio, but I would not leave this on if I were you. And the last thing you said is the 48 volts doesn't do anything for your audio. That is to be expected. The 48 volts is called phantom power. Phantom power is required for condenser microphones because condenser microphones have electronics that amplify the capsule's output and that 48 volt powers those electronics. Dynamic microphones, which is what you are using, a Rode pod mic, do not require that kind of power, so it's not gonna do you any benefit. Now, if you had something like the Fethead or the SE Electronics Dynamite or the Cloudlifter CL1, those do require phantom power. These are called microphone activators or inline preamps. The way they function is they take the 48 volts of phantom power, they boost your microphone signal by about 20 to 25 dB or 27 in terms of the FET head, and it blocks all phantom power from going through to your microphone. These are great for very quiet dynamics like the SM7B or for more 
classic ribbon microphones that are not active and could actually be damaged by phantom power. Modern ribbon microphones aren't really, it doesn't seem as though they're very susceptible to damage from phantom power, but you could still benefit from something like one of those mic activators. But for your microphone and its current setup, no need for that phantom power, leave it off. Hopefully that helped you. Best of luck on your sound. I know this was five, six months ago. Let me know what you're, how you're doing with your audio, all that stuff. Next, we have an email from Heather. She says, hey, Bandrew, how are you? Not sure if you've talked about this, so if you have, feel free to skip these questions. How do you feel about hearing clocks and watches tick? Do you mind hearing the tick tock of a watch or clock? Do you have any watches or clocks that do have an audible tick? Personally, it's not one of my favorite sounds. As always, thanks for your time, Heather. Heather, thank you very much for the email. And I recorded this a little bit earlier today because I didn't want a ticking watch in here while I was recording the entire time. So let's jump to the past so you can hear my response. Heather, thank you very much for the email. That is an excellent, excellent question, and I think I know exactly why you are asking it, because you have experience with the Timex Weekender, which may be the loudest watch ever made. Now, as far as whether or not I enjoy it or hate it, I don't mind it. I think it's nice to have this constant reminder that time is passing, that the moment that we're in is fleeting. There's this constant reminder, this tick talk, tick tock, reminding you that you're never going to get that time back. You're one step closer to being on the wrong side of the ground. You're one step closer to being an achier, grumpier person. And I'm speaking from experience because by with every passing second, I ache more, I become grumpier, I hate things more, I become more curmudgeonly as the time passes by. And by having something that is constantly ticking away, in the room with you. It's telling you, hey, it's going to happen, so enjoy the moments that you have right now. Now, as far as having a watch or a clock that ticks really loud, I do have a couple of them. I do no longer have a Timex Weekender, but I picked up a Swatch watch, which is a quartz watch, and quartz watches typically are the ones that will experience the loud ticking because they only tick once per second, so you hear that tick, talk, tick, talk. I do have automatic watches and mechanical watches. Those beat around 21,000 to 28,000 times per second or six to eight beats per second as opposed to the one per second of a quartz watch. So you will typically hear that in a quartz watch just to provide a little bit of additional information. Now I am going to take off this pop filter, put the swatch watch directly up to the microphone and I will boost it so you can hear this, and then I will try to capture my automatic watches sound as well. And for anybody interested, this is the Seiko SPB149, I believe. So I'll go ahead and do that right now. Now, I tried to pick up the Seiko, but I couldn't pick anything up on the microphone. So I am going to go grab my time grapher and put the watch on there so you can hear that because that amplifies it and mimics it. So you can hear how fast this watch is beating. So one second. And lastly, we have a voice submission from a gentleman named Mac. Mac, take it away, good sir. Thank you for sending that in. And Heather, thank you for that last email as well. Let's jump to the last submission. Hey, Bandrew. Thanks for many hours of enjoyable content and humor on your channels. Now, I do need to make voiceovers that are, are as clear, overall understandable, and smooth as possible in an untreated room. And... Well, this is the voice I have to work with. So, some kind of mid-range audio interface like an Audient ID4 and maybe a dynamic mic like the Rode PodMic should be the obvious choice. However, there is a big rub here. 
I am pretty much deaf and I use hearing aids. Basically everything above 6000 Hz is completely gone. And whatever I perceive in that range is the hearing aids grabbing the audio higher up in the frequency range and shifting it down the range into something I can hear with a lot of amplification. Needless to say, it's a massive challenge to actually evaluate audio and issues with it. I try to get by by using meters, waveforms, guesstimating, and theory, and several different listening devices. But in the end, whatever I end up with, it was sounds good to me. And I don't quite trust my hearing. Obviously, a mic that gets this pretty okay-ish out of the box with adequate level set would be highly preferable. What would be your recommendations in the budget, mid-range and high-end? Oh, and because you are you, I am speaking into the Rode Lavalier Go mic, which I use for my own location recordings with the wireless system. But right now it's plugged straight into my computer with all the issues that entails. Alrighty, Max. So I wasn't planning on doing this because I always aim to be lazy, but then my curiosity and my desire to help takes over. And then I grab 50 microphones and decide to talk into all of them. And this will also hopefully help Matt, who asked a question a little bit earlier about different microphone setups. So I'll go ahead and walk through a couple of mics that I would recommend starting from budget, going up to higher tier microphones, and hopefully that will give you some ideas. First up, we are on the Behringer XM8500. This goes for about $20 to $25 XLR dynamic cardioid microphone running into the Focusrite 18i20, gain almost at 100%, and there you go. I think this sounds about as good as it can get for $25 for a microphone. I think this even hits well above its weight class. It beats out a number of $100 plus dollar microphones as well. For $20, bucks, you cannot go wrong with this. Of course, you do need the XLR cable, you need the interface, you need a boom arm, a microphone stand, all of that stuff, a shock mount if you want. I am currently using the Shure A55M air suspension shock mount. And there you go, XM8500 is the first option that I would throw out there. Next up on the list is the Samson Q2U. This goes for about $70, but the selling point here is this is a USB and an XLR microphone, very similar to the Audio-Technica ATR2100 USB. This is another handheld cardioid dynamic and I'm using it in XLR mode, same interface, same gain setting. And it has a bit crispier of a top end. And being that you struggle to hear frequencies over 6 kilohertz, it may not be the best option for you because I find this microphone to be a little bit sibilant, meaning the S's are a bit sharp and painful to listen to. And you would need to do a little bit of processing for long form content, a DS or something like that to help out. But this is another option, pretty good for 70 bucks. Next up, I am on the Shure SM58. This goes for $100 and it's not my favorite sounding microphone of all time, but it is one hell of a microphone. You can beat the hell out of it. It's going to keep on working. And the reason why I think this would maybe be a good option for you is it's not harsh in the upper frequencies, but more importantly, people have heard this microphone so damn much at pretty much every single live show and many, many podcasts that they're used to the sound of it. Nobody's going to listen to this and say, oh my gosh, that is so offensive. How dare it sound like that? I can't handle this. Please fix it. They're going to say... I can hear Mac talking. Good. That's it. Okay. <laughs> so the SM58 for 100 bucks, I think it's a pretty good option. Then we have one of my all-time favorite $100 microphones. This is the SE Electronics SEV7. I can never remember if this is a hypercardioid or supercardioid, but it does a better job at rejecting background noise compared to a standard 
cardioid microphone. Of course, it will have a little lobe of sensitivity at 180 degrees. This one is a little bit more extended in the upper frequency, a little bit more open sounding compared to the SM58. And to my ears, it's not quite as nasally. The SM58 can tend to be a little bit nasally and a little bit forward sounding. This is a more even sound. And for a hundred bucks, if I had a hundred bucks and I just wanted to plug it in and sound good, I would probably go the SEV7 over something like the 58. So that is the mid tier option for you. Got three, four more to go through. Let's do those now. Next up, we have the Rode Procaster, and this is a $230 broadcast dynamic microphone. I absolutely love how this thing sounds. It has a very smooth midsection and then a nice treble boost to open it up, but it doesn't come across as overly sibilant or sharp or just overboosted in general. It has a pretty even sound, even though it does have a fairly large boost. Maybe I shouldn't say even, I should say smooth sound. One downside to this is p -p really sucks at rejecting plosives. So if you have if you put a lot of air out there, you may run into issues there. But for 200, 230 bucks, I th think that this thing is pretty awesome. Next up, we have the Bayer Dynamic M two zero one TG. This microphone goes for about two hundred and seventy dollars, three hundred dollars. But once you throw in a shock mount and a windscreen, you're probably looking at about 330 bucks. I like this with the A81 WS from Sure. I think that's what it's called. It's the big fat windscreen that you see on the presidential microphones, and it fits on this mic perfectly. Sorry about that. And you could put the most aggressive plosives into this thing, and it will never make a sound. And I like this. It sounds very similar to the SM7B in the sense that it has a neutral midsection, but it extends a bit higher and sounds a little bit more open. This is a real sleeper microphone, in my opinion. 270 to 350 bucks with all the accessories. I think this sounds amazing right out of the box. Next up, we have the Electro Voice RE20, which goes for $400. And... Plug and play, I think this sounds outstanding, very neutral, a little bit sibilant compared to something like the SM7B, but a pretty outstanding and universal sounding microphone. If you're using this, nobody's going to complain, just like the SM58, but you're getting a more finalized sound, in my opinion. This is what a lot of people go for when they're going for a neutral sound. Nothing really sticks out as painful. Nothing sounds like it's over boosted or overly cut. Just a great sound all around. 400 bucks, and you don't have to worry about the proximity to the microphone because Electro Voice has the variable D technology, which helps eliminate a lot of that proximity effect. So it may get louder, but you're not going to have a massive increase in the bass. There you go, Electro Voice RE2400 bucks. I think no, it's 450 bucks. My bad. I apologize for that. And the last microphone in the high tier comes from Neumann. This goes for $700. This is the Neumann KMS105, only condenser microphone in this list because I think this sounds great right out of the box. There's very little that I would do to this in terms of EQ. But 700 bucks for a condenser, quite expensive and high up there. And probably not worth it over these other microphones. But if you're looking for a condenser, a handheld condenser, it's designed for stage use. I think this sounds great. Now, some folks may be wondering, why didn't you include the SM7B or this other microphone or that one or that one? Because Mac was asking about microphones that I think would work well right out of the box. They aren't going to cause him any problems when he's doing processing or anything like that. I think the majority of these work great and sound great right out of the box. And very few people would complain or have issues or find the audio from these devices painful or distracting. 
But then you have something like the SM7B, which is probably my all-time favorite microphone. It's definitely my most used microphone. I enjoy darker and smoother sounding microphones, and I don't like doing much to it. But one of the big selling points of the 7B is how well it takes EQ. People may buy the 7B and they will add a big high shelf to it to add a lot more airiness and openness to it to boost that up a little bit. I didn't do that. But I also know a lot of people think the 7B is just too dark sounding. And that's why I didn't include that. That's why I didn't include a lot of other microphones. Because I think a lot of other microphones do need or do at least benefit from processing and EQing and DSing, stuff like that. The Q2U definitely does need some DSing as well. So the other option would be the ATR2100 USB. But there you go. I think I spent way too much time on that. And maybe I should throw this as a standalone video somewhere. I don't know. Mac, hopefully that helped. And Matthew, hopefully that helped you as well. I think that's it. Let's jump back to future Bandrew, recording this in the past. Whatever the cool time travel thing is. Okay, bye. All right, I think that is pretty much it for this episode of the BSP. Sorry I took last week off. There was nothing going on in the news. There's still very little to talk about, but I wanted to relax. I don't want to shove an episode down your throat when I don't think I can add anything of value that really is my approach here. I I want these episodes to actually hopefully be helpful for some folks. I want to provide some benefit for folks. I don't want to just fill your time for the sake of filling time. So that does mean occasionally I will take a week off if I don't think there's anything going on or if I just need to relax. That too. <laughs> Although I very rarely do that because if you relax and have some downtime, that's when the demons start talking in your head. Kind of a joke, but not really. <laughs> okay. I love you all. Thank you so much for hanging out. I hope you have an amazing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next Sunday, I will talk at you. If you want to check out either version of the show, bandrewsays.com, go check out geeksrising.com. If you want to check out all the other stuff I work on, bandrewscott.com and watchcastage.com. I still am making videos where I review watches. I have two coming up in the next month. Super fun videos. Super fun. Okay, I'll talk to you all next week. Goodbye. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.